Hey, Jays fans, it's Jimmy Allen here from the Roll Jays podcast. We've got a great one lined up for you today. I'm sure you saw the thumbnail. You know who's going to be here. We're going to start off with two of the three of the current recruits of the 2025 class. Uh, Ty Davis and Jackson McAndrews are going to join myself, Casey Matthews, and Alex Drake. And then you all know that Casey's no longer with the program. He's no longer the video coordinator at Creighton. The new video coordinator for the men's basketball team, Lucas Vargas, is going to join us to go into details about what the job entails how he, how he got here, where he comes from, and a little bit of his backstory. And then the big two, three, Trey Alexander is going to join us to give an insight on his story, his journey to Creighton, what's different about his game this year, and uh, his expectations in his time, in his last year in a Creighton uniform. All that more is coming up right here on the Rule Jays podcast. Myself and Casey Matthews, and later we're joined by Alex Drake when we talk to the two recruits as well. We hope you enjoy it. Make sure you like and share the page. Follow us on Twitter, at Rule Jays Podcast. We appreciate the support. Go Jays. Do you need a customized online marketing plan and creative campaigns to help scale your business and achieve goals in 2023? Pixel Fire Marketing can not only help you achieve those goals, but we will help you crush them this year. Pixel Fire Marketing lives and breathes digital marketing. Pixel Fire Marketing has experts in strategic content creation, social media marketing, and website development. Check out Pixel Fire Marketing today at Attack Marketing in 2023. Welcome back into the Roll Jays podcast brought to you by Pixel Fire Marketing. We tried for the Holy Trio tonight. We could only get two out of three, so we're not going to complain. Ty Davis and Jackson McAndrews, two of the uh, class of 24 that's currently committed and signed to Creighton University's basketball team joins us now. Uh, Ty, we'll start with you. How did signing day go for you, and how cool of an experience was that? Uh, it went well. Um, you know, we we at our school, we do – we uh, have signing on the 15th, like everyone's going to sign together on the 15th. So I was able to just do it at my house with my family and my close friends and uh, my AAU coach came. So it was just, you know, it was, it was fun. It was really, really fun making it official. You, uh, you brought up your, your parents and your, your relationship with your dad on football Sundays. How big, how big of a support system are they for you right now? Uh, they're awesome. You know, they're the heart and soul of everything. I go to them for everything. So just having their unwavering support has been been a blessing jackson what was signing day like for you and uh how, how exciting an event was that for you guys up in minnesota yeah it was very exciting we always do it um in the morning before school we have like all the athletes um like kind of line up and do all do their signing at the same time coaches and uh support system families all can come and watch Going forward, obviously, Ty, you got you guys are in, in, into your season and your uh, your two games in. You've been a little under the weather this week. You guys still are two and zero at this point, though. Uh, what has the start of the season been like for you up until this point? Yeah, it's been you know it's been a good start. Obviously, I was a little under the weather on Friday's game. We put out a pulled out a close game. We were down six, and then we ended up extending the lead to fourteen, and we won by uh, twelve. But you know, the first two games are always huge, huge games to learn from because we don't have as many exhibitions as some of the colleges do. We don't have, you know, three, two, three games before the season to play. But um, I think they went as well as they could have. Jackson, you're still a, a month or so away from the start of your season. You start practice this upcoming week. What does off-season preparation look like for you? Yeah, off-season just consists of – uh, we always have our team workouts and stuff throughout, and then just individual training as well, lifting. Um, big, been a big emphasis for me, getting the weight room a lot, um, and just staying in the gym. Do you guys, as, as recruits, and add Larry into this too, do you guys have any, like, not necessarily wagers, but uh, friendly competition going on amongst the three of you on how your seasons go? not not yet um <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure we can talk about it towards like the season gets like really deep in and we kind of get you know into the playoffs and stuff jackson's like hey man can i just start my season before we start about talking about how i perform <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh ty uh talk a little bit i mean obviously uh we, we tried getting larry larry johnson's not with us tonight he's got a very busy schedule he's currently traveling uh with with his travel team what is the relationship like between you three? Oh, uh, it's good. We you know we have we have a couple group chats and stuff, and we like we like talking on them and 
um you know me and jackson's relationship start or actually i me and larry played together um in aau whenever we were in i think fifth or sixth grade we played a uh a tournament wow. for the vipers and that's kind of when our relationship started and then you know just kind of talking to him over the years and stuff it's been it's been um good to see him commit and sign as well but then me and jackson have been talking for a couple months now since he's committed and it's just been you know it's been a blessing getting to know these guys and know i'm going into creighton with a bunch of good dudes jackson for you what's your favorite part of this relationship been yeah same thing just meeting new people um obviously knowing that you're going to creating with great guys and just um, building relationships with them. Like I've been talking to Ty ever since he committed um, and Larry too for a while now. So it's been good to uh, meet new people and build relationships with them. Ty uh, and, and Jackson, I'll, get, I'll ask you the same thing. You know, you're growing up, you're playing basketball, you got huge dreams. Uh, when did you know or really believe that you were a – a high major division one basketball player. Is there a certain moment, a certain game or like, can, can you, maybe you don't even remember it, but um, I would say, you know, I've always dreamed of playing like high, high level division one basketball, but really, really, I would say this year going into my A or I would say like two or two or three years ago. Cause I'm like, when I got with my AU organization, my, my director told me that it's definitely a possibility, something that he sees me doing, but, Really, when I sat down with my dad this year going into the season, he asked me what my goals were. And my goal, I told him that, you know, to go play and commit to a Power 5 team. And obviously, you know, with Creighton offering and being, you know, top top 10 in the nation, you can't turn that down. So um, that, that's been big. How about, how about you, Jackson? Yeah, I think for me it was probably sophomore year and then sophomore AAU season, just going up against guys that – I you know, had offers from these high major colleges and just uh, playing as well as them or out playing them uh, was definitely, definitely my like thought, like, oh, I can, you know, do that too. And did that, did that realization, did it drive you even more? Do you feel like you guys worked harder once, once you really believed it in your heart that you could do it? For sure. I would say, you know, I've always worked really hard, but then whenever I finally started seeing, you know, offers come in and, seeing like the work that I'm putting in really showing off that, you know, maybe want to work even harder. Yeah. You're both, you're both top 100 recruits uh, in the nation and, and throw, throw Larry into that as well. When you, you see not, not only the, the effort from your, yourselves, but Ty, you brought it up the effort from this university and, and, and the talks uh, about playing for a national championship, final four elite eight aspirations when you know that the guys that are there now probably won't be there next year as far as the starters, how much motiva- How much of an attraction was that to you guys to maybe be able to play a little bit earlier as well? We'll start with you, Ty. Um, definitely. It definitely was an attraction to me just because, you know, you don't want to go somewhere that you don't really have an opportunity. And I feel like Coach, Coach Mack really, like, you know, showed how much opportunity there was going to be with Trey you know, going to the NBA, Baylor, um, Farabella leaving, you know, probably caught. But just, you know, having, like, the thought that there's going to be opportunity there makes you want to work harder and makes you want to, you know, fill that role next year. Jackson, same question. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a big um, attraction coming into an opportunity like this where you're losing, you know, a huge chunk of um, their scoring and their just their team and the opportunity that possesses um, coming in year one to play a lot. Jackson, I'll start with you here, and then we'll go to Ty. Um, kind of hard to forecast it now, but do you guys plan on getting to Omaha to see a couple of games live this season? Yeah, yeah. So me and Ty are going to come down. Uh, we play Providence. I think it's January. I forget the date. I think middle so of January. I think it's the sixth. The sixth. Yeah. So we're coming out for official then, and then maybe get into another game or two throughout the year. What's that? What's that scheduling process like? trying to navigate your season and everything like that. Is that part of your guys' like winter break or, or what? Yeah, it was just more when we had – we compared like our schedules and then creating schedule and just figured out the best time um, that would work for both of us. 
Yeah. Ty, you were correct, by the way. It is January 6th. So so you're up to date on your Creighton basketball. <laughs> yes, sir. I think because we play the um ninth, so I have like three days there to where I can, you know, get back and get get a couple of practices in before our area games start. Guys, Jackson, let's start with you here. A lot of people that will watch this don't they, – they never played college sports. They don't know how recruiting works, and they certainly don't know what that last couple of days is like before – you decide and before you call the, the, the team that you're going to commit to and then also the teams that you're going to tell no to. Can you think back to that? We'll call it 48 hours and you're making your decision and you, and you, you feel it now. Like I've got to call these guys that have put a lot of time, a lot of energy into my recruitment and tell them I'm not coming. But then I also get to call my coach that I'm going to play for and tell them I'm coming. What did that process, how did that feel? How did you maneuver it? Is there anything that really stands out that you weren't expecting to go through uh, throughout that process? Yeah, yeah, it was something I always, obviously excited to call the coaches to commit. And when I called Coach Mack and everyone else, they were all excited. It was a very exciting time for me and my family. But then that realization hits in, you have to call these other coaches. And that's something that we're like, I thought of during the process was going to be tough, but I never thought it was going to be tough as it was because you're, like you said, you're you're calling these guys that you make great relationships with and um, and build over like years. Um, and to have to call them and tell them you're not going there is it's a tough thing to do, for sure. What yeah. was that? What was that process like? You said you called Mac, and then and then you just called the other guys right away. Just just get it over. You just get it over with. Yeah, yeah. I called Mac. Called every assistant too. And then it was I call him at. I think it was at night, and then I called the other coaches, told them no the day after, and I committed the next Just day. ripped the Band-Aid off. Yeah. <laughs> Ty, what about for you? Yeah, for me, you know, I was obviously coming off my official from right from Northwestern. The, I actually committed the day after that to Creighton. But, you know, just I was super excited, but then just the realization set it. After I called Coach Mack, I think it was uh, the 26th or – 20, I'm not sure. I, whatever. It, two days before I announced, it was a Saturday morning. But I uh, called Coach Mack, and, you know, I was super excited and called the coaches. And then that night I called um, called Coach Altman and Coach Fish from Oregon. And, you know, just it, – it was tough, like Jackson said. How, how, much, how much did Coach Altman tell you about how bad Creighton is because he'd been there? <laughs> no, no, actually, I'm, he, I'm he, sure he, I'm he, sure he, he didn't. He didn't do any recruiting at all. He was <laughs> – he was great, but but he um he tried to tell you how sweet the gear was though. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but just you know, calling those guys who you've had relationships with for you know over a year, and them calling and texting you every day, and you build relationships. Kind of, they're kind of like become family for a little bit, just because you kind of you text them and talk to them all the time. But then I called, so I called Oregon that night, and then I called called, called Coach Collins the uh, next morning. And kind was of. Was that kind of who it was down to for you? Was it down to Creighton and Oregon? I mean, I, I know you took the visit to Northwestern and you had a couple others that yeah. you were possibly thinking about. Yeah, I would say those are the main three. Probably probably Oregon and Creighton were the main two. Mm. Um, but just after I went on the visit to Creighton, I kind of knew that's where I wanted to be. And nobody could blame you. <laughs> <laughs> Jackson, hey, who else was in there for you? Yeah, so the main – Four schools I cut it down to. There were a lot of schools that were trying to come in late, um, but I kind of wanted to cut it down after Peach Jam. Um, so I cut it down to like um, Creighton, obviously, Notre Dame, Xavier, and Wisconsin. So we've uh, focused on those four. We, it, it, was there any, any one of the other three schools for you, Jackson, that was more difficult to call than the others? Just kind of tie, tie a reference to Oregon. Yeah, I think – so I, I called um, – so I had to make calls before I narrowed it down to, um, right. to the four. Those were a little bit easier because I hadn't been talking to those as much. But I'd probably say uh, equally, honestly, all three of those schools have put so much time and effort into me and calling me, texting me every single day, like all the coaches on staff. So it was, it was tough to call all those schools. I don't know if one stand out more, but all of them. We're joined by two of the uh, currently committed and signed Creighton, future Creighton Blue Jays, Ty Davis and Jackson McAndrews, who's going to 
joined Creighton next year uh, on the men's basketball side of things. Ty, Ty, for you, we've we've seen a we've seen an emphasis on strength and conditioning on this year's Blue Jays team, and guys are getting bigger. Have the coaches talked to you about weight regimen or, or or stuff to do in the in the weight room to get ready for basketball at the next level next year? They um they haven't yet, but Coach Mack mentioned um after our season they said josiah got on a little after his season last year he got on a little train uh weight program and so they said that they could send it to us after our season kind of we can start focusing on it for those upcoming months leading into june and july of uh next year who do you think can bench press more you or coach mac (laughs) coach mac for sure (laughs) jackson what about you what is your uh, casey casey is that can you validate that I've never seen Coach Mac bench, uh, but I, I, it's one thing I'll never do is bet against that man. I he'll he's the be- he's the most competitive we, person I've ever met. We did so play ping pong whenever he came in for. Uh, I do remember that, and then I remember the it. ping pong match. And who won? So I was up twenty fifteen, and he came back and beat me twenty two. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting to see if you tell the truth, Ty, because I I remember that I was in there. <laughs> yeah. Jackson. Jackson, what is uh, what have they told you about your weight training program, and, and what are you doing to kind of keep up with it? Yeah, obviously, just to make it a point of emphasis um, during the off season, and then once our season gets done, so just basically the whole summer, and even right after our high school season ended last year, just been in the weight room four to five times a week um, with trainers and stuff, building strength, um, working on athleticism as well, and just all that stuff. Did you pick up the ping pong paddle at all when you were in Omaha? I did not. We got to mm-hmm. do though. Okay. <laughs> smart man. Uh, uh, I was going to say smart man. Um, have you guys had a chance to watch either of the first two games? And if so, kind of what are your thoughts? Jackson, yeah. you can start first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah I probably should have led with that. <laughs> pretty much all the first one, most of the second one. Uh, it was just really fun to watch. Shoot a lot of threes. Um, I love how they move the ball. I play very fast, um, play with pace and space the floor obviously very well. It's kind of like you got to pick if you want a wide open three or a dunk from Kalk. So it's just a lot of fun to watch. I play together, share the ball. Um, Yeah. Ty, you've been a little bit under the weather and obviously have been in the middle of your season. Have have you been able to catch either one of the games? Yeah, so their first one was uh, the same time as our first game, but I was able to watch the uh, game yesterday. And like Jackson said, you know, them shooting a lot of threes. I saw a stat today. It was like they're tied with, for first in the nation of, you know, made threes through the first two games, averaging 15 or whatever. And like you said, you know, having cock, big, big cock down low, you got to really choose if you want to, you know, give up a dunk or just a wide open three to Baylor or Trey or, you know, Steven, one of those guys who just doesn't miss Mason yesterday. Yeah, he's um, up there. So. And. I mean, let's let's go back a little bit to the to the recruiting piece because I'm interested to see Ty. Uh, both of your parents played uh, college basketball, and so I'm sure you got a lot of great advice from them throughout this process. And and you you know I know your your decision was tough, right? You had a you had some factors that ultimately led you to to Creighton. What were some of the messages that your parents uh, were delivering to you? I'm sure you, I'm sure the decision was was yours, mm-hmm. uh, but I know they had a big part in that. Was any of their experience being collegiate athletes, did that play a factor for you? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, just – and my dad being a coach now, that helped as well because he's kind of had to deal with some other other of our uh, guys' recruitments. But he's, you know, he's your high school coach, right? He is. Yeah. He okay. is. So he um, – they ultimately wanted me to make the decision, but they <laughs> led, you know, led me in the right direction. And they said that, you know, some coaches can be – completely fake on your visits and stuff and can be completely fake to your face like while they're recruiting you but then whenever you get in you know dog fights and stuff they're they'll turn like you know they'll they'll be obviously they're going to get on to you and stuff but they're not they're not the same person who recruited you and you know we could all tell that that coach mac was real and you know he's not and the whole staff really like you know i love all those guys so they uh you know they just wanted me to pick a staff and then whenever we went to uh dinner you know, just hanging out with the guys and going and playing pickup with them, just getting to know them. You know, you know, you're gonna be around good guys every day too. So, yeah, that influenced it as well. And Jackson, you know, obviously, you your family has had a relationship with Coach Mac your whole life. Um, how how big of a factor was that? And, and I mean, your dad knowing Coach so well had to be huge for you in this process. Just kind of knowing what you were getting into, 
Um, but what were some of the, the ways he was able to help you through your process and, and your mom too? I know coach Mac, lo- you know, loves her. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, what were some of the, the messages you were able to get from them? Yeah. So obviously just them being a big part in it. Um, and they didn't, they let me make my own decision. Like my dad used to always said, like I made my decision picking coach Mac. Um, I'm gonna let you make yours, but they definitely helped me see things from other perspectives. And, um, kind of helped me uh, see a bunch of different views. And obviously, like, my dad playing for Coach Mack, so obviously there's a huge trust level there that um, is probably more than all the other coaches um, right away. Um, so that was definitely a big factor in it, um, knowing, like, kind of what Ty said, like, Udell is a real coach. Like, what he's saying is real. And same with all the other coaches on staff. Um, love them all, and they're all great people. And, um but yeah, so I, was, I think the trust factor was the biggest thing with my dad's relationship with him. Um, other than that, it was just, just love creating, yeah. Have, have you gotten to, and maybe it won't even really kick in until later in life, but like have, have the chance to fully appreciate the fact that you and your dad are both getting the opportunity to play for the same guy? Yeah, yeah, it definitely has hit me um, that we both are going to be playing for him, which is really cool. That's something that obviously doesn't really happen at all. Um, a lot at all but yeah it's definitely hit me a couple times and it's just crazy to think about well fellas we greatly appreciate your time thank you so much for joining us we'll uh we'll catch up with you guys later in your season maybe after you guys cut down a net or two how does that sound sounds good sounds good thank you that's ty davis and jackson mcandrew two future creighton blue jays we'll be right back with uh more insight on the program take a look around the rest of creighton university here on the roll jays podcast brought to you by pixel fire marketing Do you need a customized online marketing plan and creative campaigns to help scale your business and achieve goals in 2023? Pixel Fire Marketing can not only help you achieve those goals, but we will help you crush them this year. Pixel Fire Marketing lives and breathes digital marketing. Pixel Fire Marketing has experts in strategic content creation, social media marketing, and website development. Check out Pixel Fire Marketing today at Attack Marketing in 2023. As we roll on here in the Roll Jays podcast brought to you by Pixel Fire Marketing, kind of the newest Blue Jay, <laughs> Lucas Vargas joins us now, the new videographer for Creighton. Lucas, you, you, you took over a role uh, in a department that was obviously not well manned and, and not well maintained from the slacker that was there before you. <laughs> what has it been like to come into this role? Uh, you know, just trying to follow in the footsteps of, uh, of Casey. <laughs> um, I, was, uh, I was lucky enough to get to help him out a lot for the – my two years as a GA, and it's uh, just kind of been been trying to put it all together now. I feel like I did did a lot of those things on kind of one-off basis, but now I put it all together, and so far I feel like it's off to a good start. You want to tell people, Lucas, like a little bit about the job? And, and I'm actually interested to hear your answer because I know some of the responsibilities have shifted. So, like, you know, t- tell us a little bit, a bit more, more about that and like kind of like the team – that the, the, the team behind the team a little bit. Oh yeah, for sure. It's definitely not a job that you can do on your own. Um, and uh, lucky to have a team of GAs and managers that, that help out and uh, make it all work. Uh, but as far as the job goes, I'd say, you know, the first thing is making sure all the coaches have what they need to prepare for the game scouting wise. Um, so it's kind of my responsibility to get games uh, downloaded and on people's computers. Same thing, thing with practice. Um, and, you know, that changes from week to week, what people care about, what games they want to see, um, especially now. Um, and then Coach Murfeld and I, we, we split up uh, half and half the teams that we'll play over the season. Um, so, like, he had Iowa scout where he was labeling most of that game film and cutting it up. Uh, I'm on Texas Southern. And so we kind of go back and forth between the, the teams that we'll play over the season and scouting it from their, the other team's offensive perspective, so the places they're running. Um, so a lot of the times that's uh, that's what we look at as we scout. And then Coach Miller and one of the GAs, that kind of look at the other team from the defensive side of the, of the ball. Um, and then Murph and I, we both work with Jalen from there. And then uh, Mitch, uh, our other GA, he he works with Coach Kellogg on the personnel side. So that's uh, that's kind of how we all divide up the scouting responsibilities from, from that perspective. And then we've got a, a team of managers that help out with – various things whether like that's uh 
coding the games, which means breaking it down into offense and defense so that then we can take our respective sides of the ball and get to get to scouting it or after the game kind of go going back through and labeling our ball reversals and paint touches and we've uh, we've really worked a lot on expanding our analytics uh, department I would say especially internally uh, something that I think we take a lot of pride in and really fits in with the way that we play as well our our fast paced style uh, the amount of threes that we take we're trying to take obviously shots at the rim shots from three kind of in line with the analytical models and um, the managers do a great job of helping helping label that stuff to to get the numbers that we're looking for because um, there's not a lot of not a lot of places that you can go to get those numbers if you don't do it yourself. Um, and then we have Michael, Michael Fee, he works at Huddle, uh, but he, he helps us out a lot as well from the video perspective. He's, he's taught me a lot from how to use the softwares that we use. And then he also cuts up a lot from our game perspective and also helps in with the, the analytics. Um, he has really good relationships with some of the companies that we use and able to tie in all that data together. So it is really much more than just a one man job and it really all ties in together. I, yeah. I love that. I love that we're in a world where Mitch Ballock is just now another GA we have. <laughs> but uh, when, when you talk about numbers wise, how many people do you have? Uh, I don't know if underneath you is the right term, but but uh, that work with you, uh, and how big is that team? So I'd say, I mean, I share an office with both the GAs, Javon and Mitch. Uh, so that's that's where we kind of we kind of start with the work, uh, go from there, and then we have uh, probably about ten managers that really do a good job of. They help out and they, they do different things uh so like our freshmen they they really help with practice mostly uh that's that's kind of their responsibility is to make sure practice gets filmed um and then some of the sophomores uh their their main responsibility is to help draw plays for scouts so as we go through and label things we'll give it to them and then that's kind of the the drawings that we'll have for our scouting reports uh the juniors and the seniors they're they're mostly tasked with the the post-game analytics responsibilities that i talked about like the ball reversals and the paint touches and kind of trying to tie things into our plays so that we can get efficiency reports. Um, so I, I would say those, that's kind of how we split up among the managers. And then I would say Murph and I, like I said, we kind of go half and half with the games and then it goes upwards to the assistant coaches from there. Yeah. So Lucas, traditionally the video, the video coordinator hasn't been a super intelligent person. Uh, now with you being in there, um, you know, I think we've got somebody that has, has some brains. And, and so uh, you, you do a whole lot more than just get the coaches the film that they need to break it down and scout. You're a huge part of that process. Uh, and so can you tell us a little bit more, like, from an analytics perspective? Let's take, let's take last night's game in perspective for, for Iowa. And I'm sitting there in the crowd, and I'm hearing a lot of fans like, man, we got to take that mid-range shot away. We can't let them keep shooting that, so they keep making the shot which I understand as a fan when someone is continuously succeeding at something, try to take it away. However, knowing the analytics behind it, I know you guys are sitting on the bench going, no problem. Let's just keep playing the game out. Can you tell us a little bit analytically why that kind of ball screen coverage and why that defense is the right way to play? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, first off, uh, I would say, speaking on last night's game, I would say a lot of the keys to the game, we, we did a pretty good job. I felt like our, our transition defense I thought was really good. Um, I thought we took Stanford away for the most part. And um, like, and then we didn't let their their press, they ran it a couple of times, but we didn't really let that bother us. Um, I felt like those were really the three major points of emphasis that we had all week. And I felt like we did a good job executing those points. And so then, yeah, then you talk to talk about, you know, obviously it's a big game early in the season. You don't have maybe the best look at everybody. Uh, you know, they got some transfers and, you know, Cricky, he had, he had, a very good game, obviously, um, in the mid range. But well, you know, one of the most telling stats that we have is not even that advanced of a stat by any stretch of the ma imagination, but is we just strictly look at attempts, shot attempts at the rim, and shot attempts from three uh, for ourselves and for the other team. And truthfully, that that stat itself is usually a pretty good indicator, regardless of makes or misses. That that stat's a pretty good indicator of if if we're going to win or lose the game, and um, Especially if we have, uh, I think our goal is to have 77% of our shots, our shots either at the rim or from three and hold the other team to, I think it's less than 63% of their shots at the rim or from three. And so, so when you talk about last night's game and 
you know, it, <laughs> it, it, it looks weird. It, it, it looks weird from the bench to watch, uh, to watch a big guy basically take pick and pop twos essentially. And to, <laughs> to get kind of hot. And I, mean, I think he finished 11 for 16, maybe was his final shooting line, but yeah, it started off six for nine from the first half and then 11 to 16 for the rest of the uh, rest of the game. But you know, no threes in there. And you know, we made, we made a few adjustments to kind of stun at him and get a hand up. But at the end of the day, like that's not something that I was shown before. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's really what he, his game, like he's not looking to take that many shots from that area of the floor, I don't think. And you make a team do something they're not used to doing. And yeah, sometimes like it's frustrating to watch the ball go in the basket, but you also have to be patient enough to know like one, that the other team's doing something they're not used to doing. And then also that over the a lo- a larger sample size over the course of the game, that that's not going to, that's not going to win, win you a game doing that. And uh you know, if he's taking pick and pop threes, maybe it's a different conversation. But I think, uh, from an analytical standpoint, for them to take, I think, I think it ended up being thirty mid-range shots, um, and that that, like I said, with the initial stat that we we look at, like that's usually going to end up being pretty good for us. And it wasn't even last night. I mean, this team is taking away defensively, essentially their first three opponents' best offensive weapon, Bowden Scunberg, who led North Dakota State again last night in scoring, only dropped four points against this defense. What are you guys seeing on film that this defense is doing specifically that's different from a year ago that's been so dynamic this season? Yeah, I think some of the, some of the matchups uh, that we're able to, to scheme with, I mean, especially on the wing, I think Trey, obviously, we know how good of a defender he is, but Baylor, I think, really taking, taking a step forward defensively. Um, and then along with just everybody being, being really smart basketball players, we have, we have a very smart team very uh, high IQ team. They all understand what we're trying to do and they understand like where we're trying to force guys and the spots we're trying to force them to. And there's a lot of guys that aren't comfortable getting to that mid range, uh, especially when you, when you force them into it. And that's a, uh, that's a big point of emphasis against North Dakota state. It was a huge point of emphasis against Iowa. Um, obviously I was a team that plays kind of like we do. And I think, I don't think they took very many threes overall in the game because they took so many there in the mid range and, like I said, just over the course of a game, like that stuff does matter. And it's just kind of been our philosophy. And I think it's what we built the defensive identity around. Yeah, j- just just 14 attempts last night from three. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that, too, obviously, we, we know it goes back to Ryan Cockburner and and how good he is, you know, as, as a defender and, and how we traditionally we've been able to force teams to, to score outside of that paint area or that around the rim at rim area. Um, can you talk a little bit about just the way that, that you prepare every day as the team prepares every day for that to, you, you have to, you have to practice it. And so uh, from a, maybe from a communication standpoint too, um, but just overall, just like, how do you prepare to, to force those shots? Yep, absolutely. And you know, the first thing is when you talk about three point defense is just letting someone shoot it or not. And we take a lot of pride. I feel like in our closeouts, and how we uh, we practice those. I mean, that's something that we work on. Usually, it's the start of practice every day. Spend a, a few minutes just working on closeouts. Period. Um, those closeouts are important just to take take shooters off the line. And then our ball screen coverage. I mean, basketball now has become such a ball screen centric game, and the way that we play our ball screens isn't how every other team does it uh, with that drop coverage. And it is a, a two man defense for a lot of the game. Uh, we have a great communicator back there with with Ryan Kalkbrenner, and he does a great job talking guards through their screens. But those guys do a good job too, and it's it's a hard skill to practice uh, contesting shots while you're behind a guy, and you're coming over, the, you're trying to fight over a ball screen, and the guy might have you on his hip, and you have to be able to contest that shot without fouling. That's that's a hard thing to practice. It's a hard thing to do, and it's a skill that, like you think back on the last two years, that's a skill that's won us some games uh, as teams. You know, teams obviously they scout you too, and they know they know what kind of defense you're going to play. So they're drilling those tough pull up twos uh, that week, knowing those are some of the shots that they're going to get. And to to not foul and to be able to still provide good contest from the guards' perspective in that situation, it's something that we have to work on. And it starts in the summertime. It's it's impressive to watch young guys or new guys when they get here. They've never played that kind of ball screen coverage, and to develop the like kind of the savviness to navigate those ball screens. And then, cause then you have to switch at certain points and that's uh, that shows up in North coast state, I think was a great example. Some of the switches that took place, Trey Baylor got some steals on those. And 
it's uh yeah it's it's who we are though and it's our identity and it's it it's uh every day you know how how can you scheme it and and you do scheme it a little different as you play different teams but but it's uh, it's just like anything else you gotta keep working on it lucas vargas the uh, new video video coordinator at creighton is uh, joining us here on the roll jays podcast you uh you get to see these guys almost every day and you get to see the off season preparation i think one of the key stories of these first three games has been the development of Trey Alexander on the offensive side of the thing. He just looks like uh, something that's taken that next step. When you're this far into it and you're, you're this involved and immersed in the process, can you appreciate how much the, his game has grown or is it just because so much a part of the job that stuff like that is just kind of goes unnoticed because it's an everyday uh, uh, r- ritual that you have to go through and break down film? No, I mean, for, for me, it, it's something I really appreciate because when I showed up uh, as a grad assistant, I mean, that's really your number one responsibility is to be on the floor working with those guys in uh, player development. And not that I was always working with Trey necessarily. I mean, Corey Edwards and Trey Ziegler, those guys did great work with Trey, especially while they were here. Uh, but but I was down there on the floor with them, and I watched, I watched him show up as a freshman. I watched Mason show up as a freshman, and Ryan – uh, he was a sophomore, but I mean, really, his first year on the scene. Right. And those are the those are the guys that have been here, along with Sammy, the the same amount of time that I have been here. And like Trey, Trey and Ryan were the first two guys that I worked out uh, when I was when I was in my GA job. So like, I remember the first time I ever saw those guys on a basketball court. And like, yeah, it's it's something that I I mean I can't appreciate it enough like how far those guys have come like the type of player that Trey is, even just like the the explosiveness that he's, he's began to show, like some of the dunks that he's had, those weren't plays that he was making, you know, especially two years ago, but not even last year. Um, you know, Ryan, the way that he runs the floor now, like how in shape he is. And just, but more than that, I think like the relationship that all those guys have developed, uh, the leadership that those guys have stepped up into, especially Trey. Um, I'm, I'm really impressed with how he's taken on a leadership role with his team. He's the voice that everybody listens to and he makes everybody else feel comfortable. I think they all believe in him. They all see him as, as the leader. And that's an important dynamic to have on any team. Uh, If if you, if you can't tell who your leader is and if your if your best player is not your leader, then I think it makes it really hard. And I think we're lucky that, that that's, that's true for our team. Yeah. And Lucas, I, I, I'll say, say this. I think the Jays are lucky to have you on the staff and someone that cares as much as you do, uh, that puts in the time and the effort and, and all that you do. And, and I like to ask this question um, is, is uh, tell us more, you know, about Lucas, like what, like, who are you? Cause I think there's a lot of, a lot of our fans that they see you, but don't know uh, much about you and, and, and your background. So um, yeah, tell us just like kind of as, as we close here, like what, what are your goals? Like, why are you doing this? And um, just sort of what, what makes you uniquely qualified uh, to excel in this role, and how and why are you going to be the next head coach at Creighton University? Whenever Greg there you go, that's the hanging up. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, first off, um, but so yeah, I'm from Austin, Texas originally. Uh, that's where I grew up, and you know when I was going into high school, I went. Uh, I, I thought you know maybe I could play varsity basketball, and I mean that just didn't happen. I mean I'm a short little dude. It's all right, uh, <laughs> but um, you know I, I was lucky enough though to have a high school basketball coach that. Uh, he was a manager at, at University of Texas, and he really saw the value in, in student managers. And he actually asked me if that's something that I wanted to do. Um, and I, I played some other sports too, but like the when I talk when I tell people about high school, for me it was like that was that was probably one of my favorite things to do. Actually, was be a basketball manager because of the the role that my coach gave me, and like just the way that he made me feel like appreciated and that I was a part of everything. Um, and I mean, I had, a, I had a great time, especially in you know, the, the players on the team. They did a great job and I was friends with them as well. Um, and I think, you know, it was just something that like I, I think in sports to keep going with it, everybody has to have one person that kind of makes them want to keep going. Like you have one person that like you're like that guy made me like want to keep doing this. And I think when you don't experience having someone like that, in your life for a long enough time, you, you stop doing it. And I think that's, at least for sports, that's kind of what I've experienced and, and witnessed with other people. Um, so I was lucky that coach Pittsford at Anderson high school, like he was kind of a good role model for me. I wanted to be a manager in college then. And 
I didn't get a chance to do that on the men's side at University of Michigan, but I did get to do it on the women's side. I had a great experience, worked with great managers and great staff, great players. I uh, was lucky enough to make the Sweet 16 my senior year. And then really uh, in the summertime, I get to go back to Texas and worked with a few groups, but mostly a basketball trainer named Zach Urbanis. And that's where I got a lot of player development experience, ended up actually making the connection to come to Creighton. And I mean, it just kind of just happened. I mean, I, I don't really know how I ended up here all the time either, but got lucky enough to to find myself getting the call on a Saturday and then driving up here on a Monday to get started and not really never been to Omaha before or anything like that. And been here ever since. Um, we appreciate you bringing that Texas heat with you. <laughs> Um, but I, I do love it here at Creighton. It's been a great place for me with great people that I think my my personality uh, especially fits in here, and that's something that I appreciate. Um, it's been a place that's allowed me to grow into the the role that I'm at right now. And I mean, really, the only thing that I care about is is having a good time and trying to make sure that other people have a good time. Because to me, basketball is a game. At the end of the day, like obviously, there's great lessons that you can teach with it, and there's great experiences that we all have with it, but I mean, it's a game that we're all lucky to do. We work too hard to not have fun doing it. The players work too hard to not have fun doing it. So to me, all I want to do is see those guys smile and have a good time and to do that with the people I work with also because that's really why I, I like sports. That's why that's why I do it. I mean, I love to compete too, but you kind of com- combine those two things into one one area like basketball, and, I mean, that's what it's all about for me. So uh, once it stops being those things, I'm probably going to stop. But right now it's it's a, a heck of a journey, and I hope it keeps going. That's Creighton's new video coordinator, Lucas Vargas. Lucas, thank you very much for being here today on the Roll Jays podcast. We'd love to catch up with you and get more of your story down the road. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. We'll be, right back. We'll be right back with uh, Trey Alexander to talk about his performance thus far this season, last night against Iowa, and a lot more here on the Roll Jays podcast brought to you by Pixel Fire Marketing. Do you need a customized online marketing plan and creative campaigns to help scale your business and achieve goals in 2023? Pixel Fire Marketing can not only help you achieve those goals, but we will help you crush them this year. Pixel Fire Marketing lives and breathes digital marketing. Pixel Fire Marketing has experts in strategic content creation, social media marketing, and website development. Check out Pixel Fire Marketing today at Attack Marketing in 2023. Welcome back into the Roll Jays podcast. Jimmy Allen, Casey Matthews with you here, brought to you by Pixel Fire Marketing. That gentleman uh, below us couldn't be described as anybody else, but then maybe the leader of this uh, number eight team in the country right now. It's Trey Alexander who joins us here on the Roll Jays podcast. Coming off maybe the performance of your career against Iowa on Tuesday night, you look to be in a different gear right now. What's different about Trey Alexander from March to November? Uh, I think the game's just slowed down for him. Uh, I think that uh, he's starting to figure out uh, ways that he can get his teammates involved, but also uh, gotten a lot stronger and quicker over the offseason. So the game's just starting to slow down to him. He's starting to pick his spots well and pick and win the score and win the, win the pass. And I think the game is just starting to – his game is just starting to evolve into the player that he wants to be, so – Is it frozen? Sorry, I apologize, Jimmy. It's frozen on my end. I don't know if it's frozen on yours, but it's not on mine. Hey, hey, Dan, go ahead and edit out uh, 101 to 10. Start talking at 111, Casey. Trey, tell me this, man. Like, obviously, I've been around. I was around for the last few years, and your relationship with Ryan Emhard was was pretty cool. It was pretty cool for me to kind of see you develop. Um, and and he's a great player. He's going to do great things. But now that you have a different backcourt running mate, you know, what's that like in terms of, um, you know, just understanding how he plays and how that impacts you? Because there's been moments so far where it's just been like, it looks like you guys have played together for 10 years. Um, and then there's also other moments where you can tell you're still feeling each other out. So how's that process been? And what's what's he like as a teammate? Yeah, it's been great. Uh, I mean, just to answer your second part of the question first, uh, I, I just got done talking to Steve. Uh, I talked to him about how I felt like he was a he was a great leader, and I felt like he's 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 really one of those pieces that we were missing uh, because I think that he really does put the team first. And I was telling him that I think that his game is coming around sometime soon to where he really is just able to showcase what he can do. 
because he's being so patient. I mean, he obviously he didn't have the best game he wanted to last night. He probably didn't play the amount of minutes that he wanted to, but for him to be the the main person of the oh, you're a busy man. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> for him, for him to be the main person on the bench, just screaming and cheering and hollering for his teammates, it's really big for us. And I think that it just showcases to that that everybody on this team is so unselfish. And I think that he's the main reason for us to have that unselfishness. And uh, to answer the first part, I, I know that me and Ryan Nimhar were a great backcourt, and I and I, uh, I'm obviously I talk to him to, to this day, and that's that's still my guy. Uh, but for me and Steven, I mean, I think that he he kind of works in my favor a little more. I think that uh, he's able to play off the ball very well, and I think that works towards my game. I think he's able to do some things that uh, – uh, spacing the floor-wise that, uh, I mean, Ryan Nimhar was very uh, a pretty ball-dominant guard. And so, you know, we kind of had to take turns uh, having the ball in our hands. But I feel like Steven is – he doesn't mind taking that – that role in terms of being a catch and shoot guy and being like being able to create off of the dribble uh, on the second side. And I think that he, uh, the conversations that we have is it, just, it just helps us work together. And I think that he's done a great job of learning how to, how to play both in terms of being a point guard, but also getting people involved. You talked about the development of your body and getting stronger and faster and how the game's slowing down for you. You've added a couple of moves to the arsenal this year as well. We've seen you go to that kind of fade in, spin out, fade away jumper, and we've seen you split defenders. What have you worked on in the off season about your offensive game that you've implemented into these first three games? Uh, I think just just playing, trying to play above the rim a little more. Uh, I think that uh, being able to showcase my athleticism uh, is is a big thing for me because I feel like. Uh, that's just something that I've always wanted to work on. I always want to be a guy that can that can finish at the rim, uh, being a three level scorer and also being able to play make. And I feel like putting that pressure on the rim has been big for me. I think that that's the reason that I was able to create so much last night was was them have to worry about me put that much pressure on the rim. Uh, so for me, this offseason, I was really trying to just get stronger, get quicker, being able to jump higher, things like that, because. I mean, when you, when you have those type of that athletic ability and that strength, it, it kind of makes makes your game evolve and it makes everybody's job on the court a lot easier. Yeah, p- part of that job for you is is being that primary lockdown defender where you're going to guard the best player every night. And I know that's a challenge for you and something that you love and embrace. You know, going like like last game, <clears throat> like last night with Iowa, they hit a lot of those mid range jumpers. Yeah. To the to the average basketball fan in the stands is what are we doing? Like they keep hitting that shot. They might not understand the analytics behind it and that that's the shot that you guys are trying to make them take. Can you talk a little bit about ball screen defense and just defense overall when you know you got the big fella back there yeah. and how how you navigate, you know, getting through screens and, and, and how you navigate guarding and communicating ball screens and why it's so important to, to get – opponents to take that mid-range jumper and kind of how that how that all works together yeah i mean analytically uh the mid-range mid-range jumper is probably the worst shot you can take a mid-range jumper uh kind of like that 15 foot floater things like that are kind of the shots that we want them to take because analytically uh we're gonna we're gonna outscore a team that that, that's taking those hard mid-range jumpers that are getting those late contests compared to our uh rapid fire threes that we get up uh per game so obviously we have ryan cogbrenner back there to when they do get downhill or they try to get all the way to the rim where we can just do a late switch and ryan cogbrenner kind of cleans that up and then a lot of the time we get a lot of steals on on those switches uh but i mean just analytically it, it it's one of the worst shots you can take uh obviously i like to live in the mid-range a little bit so i mean <laughs> I, I like taking those quote-unquote bad shots but I mean, for to have a to have a two time defensive player of the year behind you, uh, cleaning up shots black back there, and also, you know, just having having a defense to where you know that it's going to wear down on people. Those mid range shots are going to kind of you're not going to be able to make all of them. Uh, they come in doses. Obviously, uh, the big guy last night in Iowa did a good job of being able to pop that. So we had to change it up a little bit, but but black coverage usually does does a really good job of of, of helping us. You know, kind of kind of make our run in the second half. And I feel like that's what we did at the beginning of the second half last night. 
you, you brought up Ryan Kalkbrenner and Casey did too, and, and I can't help but notice. But as soon as he said his name, you kind of smiled and gave a nod <laughs> when, yeah. when he when he when he brought him up. You guys had a stretch last year, obviously, where there was a ton of learning experience without him on that six game skid, and kind of learning who you guys were as a team. Is there anything you personally took away from that skid of losses a year ago, made portable to this year that improved your game at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a maturity aspect. I think that that, that six-game skid really helped us figure out who we were, figure out roles on the team, and figure out who your real leaders were. So, I mean, obviously we don't have the same exact team as we did last year, but we have guys coming in like Steven that made the NCAA tournament last year. Uh, Baylor obviously was a part of that six-game skid, me and Ryan Kalkbrenner. So, I mean, just knowing how much the big fella does for us, he makes everybody's job on the court easier. And uh, I think the maturity aspect of us going through that six games, getting that, being able to fight through that adversity and still make it to the Elite Eight was big for us. And going into this year, we know what to expect. We know we're going to face a little adversity. But for us, we're trying to, you know, kind of try to avoid that adversity. When we do hit it, we, we know how to know how to go about it. So that maturity aspect was big for us. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, going through that last year, I know we all learned a lot of lessons, especially you guys on the court of how to fight through that stuff, how to play games. Uh, when you don't have the big fella back there and try to find ways to win. And, um, you know, let, let, let's go back a little bit, Trey, to your freshman year where, you know, everybody comes in and they want to start, they want to play 35 minutes a game. You, you're, you're no different than anybody else. That wasn't your role. You, you were behind some guys and had to work and really earn your place on that team to where then last year you had a bigger role. Part of that process tell me if I'm wrong, is trusting in Coach Mack, trusting in the vision that he has for you. Can you talk about your relationship with him, how that's developed over the years, and how you personally maturing has allowed you to really blossom in this system um, under him? Yeah, I mean, first off, I think it comes with, like you said, a lot of trust in, in the guy that recruited you. Obviously, Mack has this vision for me, and I have this vision for myself. And I know that at the end of the day that – uh I can go and talk to Coach Mack. He, he's a great players coach. He, he's not going to – his his door is never closed. So, obviously, my freshman year, uh, I had a role that, that people don't see me as now, obviously. But uh, my freshman year, it, it was one of those things, like, where everybody wants to play this 35 minutes. And I knew that uh, if I was able to perfect my role my freshman year, that, that it would expand come the next year. So, I mean, it, it was just a lot, of, a lot of timing, a lot of learning how to make sure that you just stay – connecting and stay focused to your grind and making sure that you find that role that you have in that specific time and then continue just to work on your game on your own. So for me, uh, my freshman year, it was really just me staying connected to to that grind and being able to, you know, keep those conversations with Mac and having things that he's seen that I needed to work on and things that would help me have a, have a bigger role going into the next year. And obviously that next year is when I was able to kind of get into a bigger role and be able to make, make, some bigger jumps than I wanted to. So that, that was big. Two part question here. And I, cause I think they're going to be completely different answers. We're about to talk to Ty Davis and Jackson McAndrews, uh, the upcoming Creighton freshmen next year that are currently committed to this team. If you could go back in time right now and have a conversation with freshman Trey Alexander, what's one piece of advice you would give him and what's the piece of advice you would give future blue Jays? Uh, well, first, if I could go back and, and have a conversation with Trey, I, I would tell him that, uh, Number one, work on your three-point jumper. Come out with your second <laughs> three-point jumper. Uh, but also, just stay the course, man. I think that uh, people people that have dreams of going to the NBA, they uh, they try to rush the process. And I think that the biggest thing with me was was finding out how to be patient and how to be mature throughout the whole process. And I think that uh, the patience is what led is what got me to this point. Me me being able to become the player that I am. It wasn't just overnight. It was it was me having a lot of conversations with coaches, me figuring out ways that I could continue to grow my game and figure out ways that I could get the game to slow down for me. So I would say the biggest thing for me for a freshman year, Trey, would just say be patient. Uh, the time the time is coming in the near future. So and uh, for incoming freshmen, I would I would I would say just just continue to find things that that you can perfect in terms of your role. Uh, I think that uh, with the freshmen that we have coming in, they're go, they're gonna. I think that with a couple guys 
probably going to end up leaving this year. Baylor has no choice. Obviously, Ryan Kalkbrenner is going to be an NBA prospect. And also myself, I, I think that those guys will expect to come in and play a big role. And I think that uh, with Max system, he's going to teach you how to become a good basketball player and become a smart basketball player. So for those guys, I would say just just listen and learn. Always have an open ear. Always, always figure out ways to where you can make yourself better day in and day out, because the days that you make yourself one percent better is, are the days that you're going to be able to to build on and kind of build those habits that are going to help you over the years. And I think that those habits that you build over the years are what make the best basketball players because things come so natural to you in the in the in time. So I think that, that that's the biggest piece of advice for me. And that's good, Trey. That's really good. You know, tell us, Trey, I mean, I, obviously our, we have unbelievable fans, as you know, and, and they know you and who you are on the court and probably know a little bit about you off the court. But talk a little bit about yourself. Like, what are some – like, going through what you're going through right now, where you have huge goals personally, but you have – that are extremely achievable and attainable. The same thing for the team. But what keeps you grounded? Like what keeps you not looking too far into the future and allows you to focus, you know, on the day. Um, and then also just tell us, t talk to us maybe like who you are. Just tell us a little about your family and, um, and just, I, I want, I want Jay's fans to feel like they know you and who you are a little bit better after they watch this. Uh, yeah. I mean, the thing that keeps me grounded is that, uh, I mean, obviously I have family members and, and people that, that obviously keep me humble, but I, I also feel like it's just my religion is, is what keeps me grounded. I know that uh, not everything is promised in life. Not a lot of people get the opportunity to play basketball at a high level. Not a lot of people get the opportunity to play in front of 17,000 fans. Uh, it's, it's, I think it just goes back to my religion. I think that everybody has to be grateful for what they have and, and not worry about what they don't have. And I think that's the biggest thing for me that keeps me grounded. Uh, <clears throat> also, just, just speaking about my family, I uh, I have a sibling, my little sister, Michaela Alexander. She's what now she's 11. She's pretty, she's, she's getting into sports now. My father, he's a head coach of Douglas. Uh, he, he won the state championship last year in high school. My mother, she's a volleyball coach at Douglas as well. Uh, but those are the people that are in my life. Uh, my girlfriend, uh, the person that I've been with for six years now, uh, that's kind of, those are, that's my inner circle. And those are the people that I go to when I, when I feel any type of way, when I need somebody to talk to. And those are the people that have really been in my life since I've became the person that I am. And those are the people that I can thank for the reason that I am the way that I am. So those are the people that uh, have been very influential in my life. See, Casey likes to be positive and I try to take things on the negative side of things and like make it a little <laughs> more entertaining. We, we started this conversation before we hit record today talking about social media. Is there anything you, is there a receipt you've kept or anything you keep in the tank that you've seen maybe on Twitter or, or on Instagram that you kind of use as motivation? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously I keep those, keep a lot of receipts. I, I like to find any way that I can to get like a little motivation. Uh, I actually seen the tweet last night, uh, from, from an Xavier fan that was like, uh, <laughs> they were like, they were like, man, I'm so glad Trey played good tonight so that when Desmond Claw guards him, he can just lock him up. I was like, <laughs> so, so now I kind of got January 23rd marked on my calendar. So I'm, yeah, I'm really excited for that Xavier game. So those are just little things I try to give myself a little motivation and kind of, you know, keep me going. We, we have to ask because one one tweet that has been referenced uh, almost at nauseum on this podcast is the yeah. uh, don't poke the bear tweet. <laughs> can, can, yeah, yeah. Can you give us a little insight into that story and exactly what all went into that? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I really like I'm one of those people that don't really talk a lot on the basketball court until somebody talks to me. And so I feel like uh, when somebody kind of gets to jabbing at me a little bit, that's kind of when I really like go into like really lock. That's when I really lock in. And I feel like uh, like the like a game in the Bahamas that we had when we kind of got got into a little back and forth scuffle with the team out there. It kind of turned into that. But also the Paul <laughs> game last year when I when I had a really good game there. So th those are the type of games that I really that I really like to get into because I kind of. I kind of look for those type of things that can kind of get me going and get me uh, just get me locked in. And I, I think those are the most fun games. And I, that's why I like, love to play basketball and, you know, just love to love to compete. It's, it's the fun part that people don't really see on the court. And I think it's, it's the best part of the game. 
a little bird told us that uh, maybe Ryan Kalkbrenner might have been the guy poking the bear. Is there uh, is there any, any truth to that at all? Uh, sometimes he does. Sometimes <laughs> he says some things. <laughs> he says some things that gets me going. But uh, Ryan Kalkbrenner, Ryan Kalkbrenner is talking a little bit more. Uh, he's starting to get out of himself a little bit. I love that he's coming out of his bubble a little bit. That's that's great for us. And I think that Ryan Kalkbrenner, when, when you see one of the quietest guys on your team talking, you, it does doesn't do anything but give you that that fuel and, and it kind of makes you be like, yeah, it means, yeah. Well, is there anything from last year's run that really stands out to you as like your favorite memory? Um, you know, from just, I, I asked Baylor this when he was on and he, he had an unbelievable answer, but like, what, what, what really stands out? Like what are the, what's the favorite deal for you? Uh, I, w- I would say that the biggest thing that stood out to me was probably us losing uh believe it or not i think that that right there really like showed me how much blood sweat and tears that the team put in together just seeing guys you know like kind of break down and kind of seeing like how much people how much every every guy on this team really loved did this year despite the wins and the losses how we just came together we were able to bond as a team create relationships that you'll have for the rest of your life and those that's the best thing about sports. I think that those relationships that you build for life are going to carry on into until forever. So I think that that was the biggest thing for me is just being able to, you know, hug my guys and being able to to cry on somebody's shoulder. I think that was the biggest thing for me. That was the biggest takeaway for me last year. That was, believe it or not, probably my favorite part of the year. You're from That's Oklahoma. You're from Oklahoma. How you talked about your family and your relationships. How often do you get a chance to go back there? And what is being from Oklahoma City mean to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I go back there every summer. Uh, I work out with my dad a lot. My dad comes up here and works out, works me out a lot. And uh, I mean, just just being from Oklahoma means a lot to me. I it's like it gives you that family feel, kind of like Omaha, because it's not the biggest city. Uh, it, it's just made up of a lot of people that that love to to watch and play sports. And uh, I think that. That's one of the reasons that I chose Omaha because of its similarity similarities to Oklahoma. But uh, I mean, I, I love Oklahoma. I always let people know where I'm from anytime they ask, or, and I'll make sure that uh, that they know at heart I'm an Oklahoma. And I, that's always where I will reside from, and I will I'll always be known as Oklahoma. That's forever. So, well, we, uh, Trey, as you, oh, good, go ahead, Jay. I was gonna say as you guys have. You know, I know the season started and you've played three games, but really we're we're just sort of gearing up, you know, and, and last night was a, was a great game. I do want you to talk about this summer and this this um, this spring a little bit and and how you've taken your game to the next level. We're seeing it on the court, but I also want you to talk about Baylor a little bit because yeah. what I've seen in him in three games is is also tremendous growth. And I was a first, you know, witness that firsthand with both of you guys and how much time you spent together, you know, working on your game. So can you talk a little bit about your guys' relationship and then uh, maybe your goals together of, uh, you know, to, to get to get this team where where you want to get to? Yeah, I mean, obviously, me and Baylor try to try to find those, those different ways we can evolve our game. And I think that this summer we kind of took it to a different level. Uh, we were able to, you know, just kind of talk about some of our goals at the beginning of the year in terms of team wise and how we were going to help attain those goals. And uh, from then on, me and Baylor were able to get in the gym a lot together, but also separately. Uh, I feel that Baylor has really taken his game to another level this year. He's a lot more efficient. He He's obviously he's been a great shooter, but a lot of people kind of forget about that because he shot under 40 last year from three, which is crazy. But he, he, he's really turning that corner to me in terms of becoming a really good leader. I think that he leads very well. Uh, he, his ability to, to play in between being a playmaker and being a shooter and being a scorer, it, it has, has really shown, has really shown dividends this year for this team. And I think he's also upped his defensive game this year. Uh, he was obviously on one of the bet, one of the better players last, last night, if not their best player, chasing them around screens, kind of getting under those goals, even got him in foul trouble a little bit. So, uh, me and Barry's relationship is great. We we definitely have have the same understanding in terms of what it takes for us to get this team to to the level that we wanted at, which is obviously national championship. But 
Yeah, I think I think that Baylor has been a reason that we have been so successful up until this point. I think he's going to be one of the main reasons that we will have the success that we have. How the hell was last night your first double double? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> did, I, I don't know, man. Did you, I, did you know that was the first one? I, I I thought that that was like my second or third. I'm not gonna lie. I I I thought that I rebounded the ball pretty well, like for my position, but. Apparently, I stay in like that five to seven eight range area. So, I I, I would have bet money it was at least three or four. And yeah. it, I I went back and did the research, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, but on more on a more serious note, and probably maybe the most serious note, um, if Trey Alexander's got the phone in his hand, he gets to choose the song for "If We Win, We Dance." What are we playing? <laughs> Ah, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> dang, I don't know. I'll probably go with like a classic Michael Jackson song, probably like okay. Billie Jean or something like something that, that's like got a good beat to it that you can really dance to. You know what I'm saying? Like nothing like really upbeat, like something like really kind of not slow, but like not fast either. Well, Trey, we greatly appreciate your time, man. Congratulations on all the success this year. And, uh, we uh we also look forward to hearing your name called on uh, June twenty third, twenty twenty three in the NBA draft as well, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate you guys for having me. We'll be right back with two future uh, Blue Jays here on the Roll Jays podcast. We'll be right back. Brought to you by Pixel Fire Marketing. <laughs> 